The Islamic movements in Nigeria are in the news again. And they're asking that their leader, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zagzaki, be released. And the chairman of the Nigerians in Diaspora Commission, Honorable Abike Dabriarewa, is rejoicing on the conviction of a man who killed a Nigerian. Well, how timely is this? This is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anako. The Islamic movement in Nigeria, Ayman, have decried the continued detention of its leader, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zaksaki, and his wife, despite a federal high court order for his release three years ago, adding that the Buhari-led government would be remembered for its failure to release El Zaksaki. Also, Femi Falana, a human rights lawyer, has also accused the federal government of disobeying valid court orders in Nigeria, while it complies with others from Britain, making reference to monies Nigeria has been ordered to pay um, in Nigeria versus uh, PNID, that scandal. We all know about it. Now, my question is, why? Why are the court orders being disobeyed? Well, um, we would think that the law is sacrosanct, but in the studio this evening, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm being joined by um, Evans Ufeli. He's a legal practitioner. It's good to have you join us, Evans. Good evening. Now, as an officer of the courts, you would be in the best position to explain to us why it seems to us, we might not be sure if that's what it is, that government picks and chooses what court orders to obey and which not to. Yeah, that is what is going on, especially in the current uh, administration we have, uh, the Buari administration, that have consistently shown um, the, the judiciary that uh, it can disrespect that institution and get away with it. And this is dangerous for democracy, it's dangerous for the economy, it's dangerous because our rating world over is going down based on that particular uh, issue. Does uh, it seem that the government is even interested in whatever rating the world you know, is concerned with? Because uh, uh, the number of court orders that seem to have been flagrantly disobeyed are much more uh, the, by the day. So the government do you is think not, the government is interested? The government is not concerned because um, uh, it, it feels that uh, because Nigeria is a sovereign state, okay, it can act the way he likes, it likes and all that. But when, when you, you look at the PNID case, you look at the guarantee that the court ordered Nigeria to pay $200 million. Okay, the, the Nigerian government has complied with that. Well, home here, we have a situation where the government has failed to obey court orders. The government disrespects its institution. The government is a clog in the wheel of success. The government goes around the place looking for who is inciting the citizen, whereas the government have failed to understand that impoverishing the citizen means inciting them. So the solution lies within the spot, because if you look at the kind of democratic engagement we have found ourselves between in the past four or five years, our rating has gone down. Our democratic engagement, our system, our politics, everything seems to be going the negative direction. And that is because the government is not proactive, the government have no capacity, the government have no strategy. So I mean, a government that have uh, almost 64% youth population, that is energy, that is power, that is strength. The government have nothing, the government knows nothing about what to do about the capacity and the strength that it has. So then there you are, find the there problems. Are, in fact, I'm guessing uh, that the government, if they're watching right now, or their followers, people who, because every day there are people who are applauding this government uh, and saying that they're doing the right thing, especially with the court orders that have been abused or disobeyed. The people who would disagree with you that this government has no strategy. This is a strategy of sorts, isn't it? What is a strategy? Disobeying court the orders, cannot be a strategy people. because it is yeah. not. A, it doesn't well, give you any kind of a leverage. Okay, a strategy is supposed to be. Uh, why don't you think they have a leverage? Well, they are disobeying court orders and they're getting away with it. No, nothing they're, they're, is being done they're about get, it. They're getting away with Isn't it. Isn't that but, a strategy that's no, working for? They are getting away with it, but the government will, in the future, okay, come to realize the mistake and the defect because we are going to have a lot of problems in future. Because now, if you look at the political structure, 
you look at the young people in Nigeria, how many of them have been committed to prison, detention, for offenses unknown to law? Okay, and then you have that problem. And then looking at uh, the uh, um, Elza Zaki, okay, the leader of the Islamic movement of Nigeria, it is three years now, three years today, that he has been in detention. The court, the Federal High Court in Kaduna, you know, granted him bail. And then the federal government refused to, to obey that order. The federal government is in contempt of court. And then it seems like they want to keep on that track because they have duplicated the same issue with the Shores case, with uh, a lot of cases we have all over the place. Well, we're beginning to see a trend of sorts because as we speak, a governor in the South South, precisely Cross River State, has also told the line of the federal government and has illegally detained um, Agba Jalingu. Yes, a, a journalist. Mm. And they quoted things like treason as a reason for them to hold. But I was hoping, or I was thinking, because I'm just a journalist, uh, I might not know what the law says, but the courts are supposed to determine if there is treason in the first instance, right? Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm asking you as a lawyer, where's the judiciary in all of this? It, it, it seems the judiciary's tongue is seemingly cut off and you are unable to say anything. Yeah, you know, when, it, when you look at the states, okay, uh, sometimes the judges are intimidated, especially because uh, you have a situation where the governor seems to wear a lot of in influence, okay? But even as we speak, there are some judges who are also very resolute about this. In Agba Jalingo's case, trial will have to commence, and then uh, they will have to prove that treason, okay? He wants to topple the government, the treason and all that. The prosecution must have to prove that. And if that charge fails, then he will be discharged and acquitted. So, but the, the bad thing about it is that he's not been granted bail, okay? He's not been granted bail because there's a lot of influence. He's politically orchestrated. So that politically orchestrated, um, you know, uh, conspiracy is what is giving our, our rule of law a bad turn, a weak, you know, spring. Because politicians, they come with all, kind, all manner of um, disgusting procedures that they use to, you know, stifle the, the present structures of the rule of law. Let me ask this question, same question from another angle. Could it also be that the, the politicians, Dito for presidency, governors, senators, and the House of Rep members, have realized that the courts have no longer have power? Or do they no longer trust the courts? And that's why they become judge, jury, and executioner. Oh, it's not as if they don't trust the courts. I mean, when, so what could be responsible when they go to the polls? When, when they go to the polls, and then uh, after election, they all go to the tribunal to uh, air their grievances, to ask that uh, the court either cancel an election, ask for a rerun, or declare them winner of elections. So they believe in the court to that extent. But when they are challenged, when their activities are brought to the fore, when their criminality are exposed, they begin to look for those persons who are militating against whatever it is they are doing. And they want to use the law enforcement agencies, who are hungry people, by the way, that can be used at any time. Okay, so they, they use them easily to achieve whatever they want to achieve. They arrest, they prosecute, they keep you in detention, they flout court orders, they won't grant bail, bail is a fundamental right, they won't grant that and all that. So they use that to make sure that they intimidate the citizens. Okay, today they are talking about regulating the social media. If you, if you look deep into what that means, what they want to do is that they want to regulate our thoughts. They want to regulate our speech. They want to regulate our minds. And this is the, the, this is the, 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 the open on pass, the imagination that God gave to man, protected by the Constitution, that you have a right of expression, conscience, assemblage, you have all that. But now they want a law that will make sure that our thought process is regulated so that we can all be cow. Because what, what we have left mm -hmm. as a Nigeria, what, what is left of us, our mind? 
and our conscience. Let me paint a picture. I'm imagining an investor, someone who, take for example, is trying to come and invest in Nigeria because uh, we're asking, we're promoting our country. We're obviously expecting these people will come. And of course, as a business person, you would do your homework, you would do feasibility studies. If you realize that it's a country where laws have been frequently abused, court orders have been disregarded, insecurity is rife, and we give it all kinds of names instead of dealing with the issue. Protests have almost been banned, and if you do show up for a protest, you run a risk of being shot at or tased. So, would you really want to invest in Nigeria? Put yourself in the shoes of an investor. And what does this do to us business-wise and economically? Well, I, I, as an investor, I won't uh, follow the, the Nigerian direction at all. Because first, the economy is collapsed. There's no power to even run investment to start with. Then talk about the social issues. The, because an investor will first of all look at the political system, the economy, the legal system. Mm -hmm because all these factors influence, look at the political system, the legal system, the economy, bankability, whether the country is bankable. Now, if the country is not bankable, it has a weak economy, it has a, a, a ruptured political system, it has a weak legal system, no investor will want to come into that kind of environment. You understand? So it's difficult for investors to come in, but the government seems to be, uh, uh, they don't care about that. But then we have all kinds of plans, you know, economic plans, and we have our budgets that were... And then we have a, an array of people called um, advisors or uh, assistants who are supposed to advise the presidency and our leaders on the decisions to take. Are you telling me that they don't see these things in black and white and they don't give these kind of advices? Because I'm wondering, if we really want to build a country, we should not be doing this, right? Well, well yeah, they, they, it's not as if they don't advise. They, the people who advise are there, they do whatever, they do their job, but it's one thing to advise, another thing to take it. And uh, I also remind you that most of the people that clog around the president are, are people who praise the president. Uh, people who cannot look at the president eyeball to eyeball and say, this is wrong. But this is right, this is where we should go. There are people who are complicit, people who are suffering from uh, what I call uh, obscurantism, partisan obscurantism. They, they are not people who can actually look at the president and curtail the president's excesses, except for some of us who are on the social media, who are public analysts, who are talking tough on this government, that the government is not getting it right. The government is not getting it right. The government wants retract, okay? The government is asking for loan again, okay, just to fund the, the 2020 budget. And then we are going to have a huge, we already have a huge debt, we're asking for my money. The yeah, National I Assembly is not helping matters. Some were saying that when this government came in, we were indebted to the tune of about 70 billion or so. Yes. Right now we're three or ten times that, that amount. And we're still craving for that. We're still craving for And this is putting the life of Nigerians, mortgaging the life of the unborn. Because when you go deep into debt, and then the money you're borrowing, you are not even using it to create uh, your fiscal policy. You're not using it to revamp the most pressing need. Mm -hmm. Because this loan now they are asking for as the National Assembly to uh, uh, ratify and all that to, so that they can have it. They say it's to fund projects. Now when you say projects, you need to mention it because I think that the greatest project that we need in Nigeria today is the investment in human capital. Investment in human capital is weak. Investment in education is almost non-existent. And uh, these are the factors that determine the future. Okay, but because we have heavily and old leading leaders, dinosaurs and archaic thinking, backward thinking people, close-minded leaders. They want that money to invest in real uh, uh, property, to invest in a, a infrastructure that will be invisible. Hmm. The money will be looted and all that. So, and then we, it takes us back again. So we're crawling.
go all through Africa, and all African countries have left us behind. We're, we're, we're just there. So, and then this is taking a very dangerous turn on the, the coming generation. Let's leave the money part. Let's go back to the issue of Elza exactly. Now, um, the Islamic movement in Nigeria uh, decried the continued detention of its leader, which we have heard. Um, they're saying that the government would go down in history for contempt over its failure to release El Zakzak. In fact, the judge who delivered that judgment three years ago said, and I quote, um, he said, he warned the government, okay, um, that holding Sheikh El Zakzaki for so long amounted to grave danger, insisting that if the applicant dies in custody, which he does not pray for, it could result in many needless deaths. And he also said that well-meaning Niger he also warned well-meaning Nigerians that the contemptuous attitude of the federal government towards court orders is an invitation to anarchy. Of course, it's an invitation to anarchy because, you know, religion is precarious. Th that is why I said this government is not proactive. You see, religion, religion, people, people stare their faith at different frequency, at different measure. There are some persons who are obsessed with that man. They are obsessed like their mind is made up that this is the only way, okay, to, to eternity or to whatever they want to see themselves in the thereafter. So when you now use the instrumentality of state and cohesion to disband that person and it passes, you are going to create a situation where people will go to that spot to renew their religious faith and carry out what you call a, a, a sword against the sea of trouble, against the state. And this is how we created insurgency, the Boko Haram insurgency. This is how we created banditry. This is how we created hooliganism. This is how we created drug addicts and then all kinds of social ills. And all the social ills, the layers we have created, we have not been able to erase one. So we are on the way to add multiple social vices in society and we have a weak police force, we have a weak defense force, we have a weak uh, mechanism, a strategy to curb, you know, so, so we should, we cannot afford to be careless. I'm wondering, are there no consequences for government's actions? So all of these cut orders that have been disobeyed and twisting, twisting of words from the courts and saying, no, this is what it should be. Especially for the case of Els, exactly. We're not necessarily clear on, us, on why he's still being held. The government has still not told us exactly why he's still being held. But are there consequences in the case of Shore, in the case of Els, exactly, in the case of Dariata and the rest of them, are there consequences? And the, 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 how, uh, I mean, oh, are the governments untouchable? The government is not untouchable. There are consequences. The judiciary must brace up to that challenge. Okay. Are you saying the, that the judiciary the, is not up to the challenge and the, that's why we're the, facing the, what we're the facing? The judiciary right is in dereliction of her duties, technically speaking, because I, w I don't know why the Attorney General of the Federation have not been committed to prison for this contemptuous act of government. How do you mean? Yes, the Attorney General of the Federation is the chief law officer of the state. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, once the government is in contempt of court, the Attorney General must be answerable to the court. Okay? And then, an action for contempt must be a leveled against him for the, the kind of access. So when, when you have that, okay, the government will begin to retrace its step because the judiciary must act. Because then now the, the fear is victimization. Okay, they might victimize the judge, they might victimize. But if the judiciary come together, but the NBA, all the members of the bench, and the NJC, Okay, come together and take but, a position. But will that happen? We all know how the Chief Justice became Chief Justice. The NBA, the bench, the NJC, you all just screamed and talked about it for a bit and then you all went cold again. Yes. Is there any comeback? Is there a coming back from where 
the, the turn that the judiciary has taken side by side with the federal government. You, you, you are right, you have a point there, but I still believe that irrespective of what should happen, the judiciary must make a statement. Forget about the, the CJN. Okay, there's MBA, there are other um, institutions within the judiciary that can take a position, okay, and make their demands known to the government. Okay, and then the government must act, okay? Because if the government does not act, a time will come when we may have to bring action against the government at the international courts. Yes, at the we are international getting there. Courts. We're getting there. We are getting there because we are signatory to international treaties that created the World Court, that created the ICC, International Criminal Court, and then they, oh, we are signatory to those. And then we have a United Nation. We are members of that uh, organization. Okay, how be it we are a sovereign nation. Yeah. We are still answerable to those treaties. Okay, and we must submit to those treaties. So. When the time comes, definitely the government must sit up. When will the time come? The time, the time is here. Because as I speak to you, we already have organizations that have petitioned the Nigerian government to uh, international bodies. Okay, why didn't the Nigerian government disobey the order from England on the PNID case? Mm. They should have disobeyed that. Okay, when, when you do that, you know. But like they, I said, they, they pick and choose what case or what court order to accept yeah, or... Well, a time is know. coming when they will not be able to pick and choose. A time is coming where they have to obey court orders. And the time is now. The time is now because we, we have an upsurge. Uh, uh, we cannot take this any longer. People are ready to you know, come out and then make sure that laws are enforced against the government. If you were the chief of staff, this is my last question, to the president. What would you be advising him on a daily? What would you be saying, especially for a government that prides itself as a zero tolerance for corruption government? They're here to fight corruption. Does this not make them look bad? And what would you be advising the presidency on this I, matter? I, I would advise the president that the office of the presidency is a brand. Okay, I would advise the president to retrace his step because he has created a negative brand for the country and the entire world is watching. The president must act presidential. His disposition... What is, what is acting presidential? He, he, he should be forthright. He should respect institutions. That is what it means. Okay? He, he should be able to um, uh, create that pattern that others will follow, that positive pattern, where if the court makes, a, just like in the US, there are a lot of things that Trump came up with that is going to do this, going to do that. The judiciary stopped him. You can't do this, this, and this. The judiciary stopped him. Okay, we're, we're praying that our democracy will grow to that level where the president will not be all powerful, all knowing, all flouting rules and all that. So I would advise the president to, to think again how long it took him before he clinched the position as a president, how long he contested. He contested four times before he became the president. And now that he's the president, he needs to hold that position with high esteem and deliver on the promise of democracy. That is what is expected of a president that leads the, the greatest and the largest black nation in the world. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Evans Ufeli is a legal practitioner. We're not going anywhere. Uh, we'll come back to talk about xenophobia. That seems to be getting the attention uh, required, but isn't it too early for us to rejoice or roll out the drums? Stay with us. We'll be right back to talk more.